Uh, welcome everyone for coming. We were finishing off last week uh, with the discussion of um, can we prove there's a God? And we finished off last week's lecture um, about the concept of eyewitness report, which is what history is. And um, we, we were discussing the fact that certain events, the going out of Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the giving of the Torah Mount Sinai, one of the greatest events in history, that the uh, Midrashim, that the commentaries say was actually witnessed by the world. There was a hush in the world when the Torah was given to the Jews, and the whole world heard and knew, which may well be why the two major religions in the world, Christianity and Islam, based their religion upon them. But still, they were still one-time events. I think the more compelling proof of a God in the world was the fact that the Jews wandered in the desert for 40 years. 40 years in a wilderness and their existence depended upon a food called mun that fell from heaven every day. That was a spiritual food in the sense that even though it was physical, it was like coriander seed. For um, it was totally absorbed by the body. So there was no waste to it whatsoever. And it was called the food of angels. Um, the, gen the nations were able to partake of it by virtue of any of it that was left in the desert where it had fallen, would melt in the sun and would have turned into rivulets of uh, like a stream. The deer would then partake, they would drink from it. And when the nations would kill these deer, they would taste the taste of the mun within it. But this happened every day for 40 years, and the miracle was that if you tried to keep it overnight, it turned into worms and it rotted. And yet, on the Sabbath, on Shabbos, it lasted for two days and did not get wormy. And whatever a person took, the amount was always the same. Whether he took a little or a lot, he would have the amount of an omer, which was about two quarts. And yet on Shabbos, on the Sabbath, the amount would be doubled, again, no matter how much someone took. And these are all stated in the Torah. And as proof to this, they, Moshe had, Moses had, God had him take one omer, one container, that was filled with this month and put it into the Holy of Holies. And even though it would rot and become wormy if it was kept from day after, from more than a day, this month stayed fresh in this earthenware container for 850 years until the destruction of the first temple. And then it was put away, was hidden with the ark, which again, which has never been found since. In addition to that, the Torah talks about the well of Miriam. This well of Miriam had to be enough water for somewhere between two to three million people and their cattle, all their livestock. The Medrash says that what they, when they would make camp in any place, that each prince would put a line in the sand from one tribe to another. And it took, you had to take a boat to go from one to the other, the amount of water that was there. And what that would do is, if you ever watch a nature channel, whenever there'd be a flash flood in the desert, the desert's a bloom. So you can imagine that the desert was a garden for them the 40 years that they traveled. Again, every day. In addition to that, they were surrounded by what was called the Ananea Kavod, the clouds of glory. One in each of the four directions of the compass, one above them, one below them. It says their shoes never wore out. It was a people mover that took them along. And they were covered, so it was a sealed environment. And in addition, it talks about a seventh cloud that rested over the tabernacle. And this cloud would be the cloud that directed them when it would unfold, so to speak and hang over the tribe of Judah, the first tribe that would travel in the desert, then they would know it was time to move. 
At night, it would become a pillar of fire, giving them light. Now, the reason I'm mentioning all of this, this went on for 40 years, every day. So if you're going to tell a fish story about a one-time occurrence, okay, maybe yes, maybe no. But 40 years, every day the mun fell, the well of Miriam, the sea of water was there, and they were surrounded by a cloud of glory that was somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 miles square that was seen by the nations around as well. You just can't make up a story like that. And the Torah continues to repeat the phrase over and over again and ends with the phrase, Le'ene kol Yisrael, before the eyes of all Israel. So it wasn't an event that was done to a couple people, the few, a hundred. This was done in front of millions of people. People that are contrarians, people that accept nothing. And they accepted the written Torah. And any debates on the, the Torah are basically with the oral Torah. Jews throughout history and people have accepted that which is written in the Bible. Because this was all eyewitness report. So they saw God in a way that we have no idea. Because these miracles could not have occurred unless it was done by the creator of the world himself. So can it be proven? That to me really is by far the greatest proof of all. But let's take a little bit more. The Torah has certain statements that are made. One, according to Jewish law, we keep the Sabbath. Six days we work, the seventh day we rest. And it's not really a, a, a concept of rest as much as God did not create on the seventh day. He refrained from creating. So we don't do any creative acts. But in addition to that, God commanded the Jewish nation that in the land of Israel that they should plant for six years and on the seventh year they should have the land lay fallow. This is a command in the Torah. And then seven times seven, on the 50th year, which is the Jubilee year, after seven um, years of seven, on the 50th year, the land would stay fallow again for two years. And the Torah says that there will be enough produce, you'll have a bumper crop in the sixth year, that will last you until the eighth or the ninth year. Now, farmers leave their fields fallow to make them stronger to produce more. That's natural. So the next year after you've let a field stay fallow, you'll have maybe possibly have a bumper crop. But not the sixth year. That's when it should be at its weakest. No human being would ever claim this to be a fact. It'd be easily disproved. And yet we see that even though the Jews did stop keeping the Shemitah, but for 360 years they kept it in the land of Israel. And for 360 years that they were there, God's promise came true. One can debate as to why for the next 490 years they didn't. Because part of it has to do with faith. But still, that is an amazing statement to be said by a person that could have only been sent by a creator, one who created the world. But again, even more, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, gives the Jews the Torah. And it says there that when he showed them the animals and birds that were kosher, he actually showed them each, each animal. All the animals were gathered for him to not only tell them, but to actually show them which is kosher and which is not. And in the Torah it says, and this was some 3,300 years ago, there are three animals that chew their cud and do not have split hooves, the camel, the hare, and the badger, and one animal that has split hooves but does not chew its cud. And to this very day, that has remained a fact. And at a time, 3,300 years ago, when the world had not been explored, to make such a statement and for it to hold true is nothing short of miraculous. 
Because somehow, some way, when the world hasn't been explored, you're going to find everything that you can possibly imagine. To make that statement and for it to be true, again, could only be said by a creator who knew this to be a fact. No one would have the audacity to make that statement that could easily be disproved. So, besides the logic, the feeling that we have, I mean, that there's a God, something that just like we have a love for a child that we get from Adam, from first man, because he was a father. It's interesting the Torah tells us to honor our parents, because Adam did not have parents, but he did have God who created him. So in the Torah, one of the commands that are given to us, to love the Lord your God, and how can God tell us to love him? It's really the same way as a person loves his children. Because it's something that's inherent within a person. Adam had this connection to God. He loved God because God was his creator. God was, so to speak, his father. And just like we have a love for our children that is natural, so too within us is this natural love for God. And when a person does not believe in God, he's going against that nature. And really what life's about is connecting the inner part of God, which is within us to that which is outside of us and making that connection. When a person does that, he becomes whole. Now, I'm not a scientist, and I would be remiss to, to try to explain it on those terms. But there was an article that uh, was written in the Wall Street Journal. You can look it up. Friday, December 26, 2014. The title of the article is, Science Increasingly Makes the Case for God. And in this article, and again, it's not within my realm, the numbers are off the chart as to the possibility of other lives, other living beings in the universe. And he makes a point that today there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for the planet to support life. Every single one which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. Without a massive planet like Jupiter, for example, nearby, whose gravity will draw away asteroids a thousand times as many, would hit Earth's surface. The odds against life in the universe are simply astonishing. And he goes on to give other examples and other proofs that, again, are beyond my scope as a restaurateur. But the key becomes that, open your eyes, it's just, it's an amazing world that we live in, and every day, you know, when I was a kid, we have a belief that there's a, bu there's a bone in the body that's indestructible, that is microscopic, and that I was told as a child that when the revival of the dead, we call Tchias Amesim, at the end of time will come, God will resurrect all bodies from it. And the truth of the matter is, it seemed pretty impossible when I was a kid. Today with DNA and the fact that one cell has all of the information of your body, all of a sudden that becomes very true, a reality, the concept of kind of a Jurassic Park. It's an amazing thing how spot on they were. I was told that everything you say is recorded. Well, it seemed pretty phenomenal then, not anymore. And if you look at the world, we believe that we are in what we call Erev Shabbos, the time just before the Sabbath. And if you had to define the world today with one word, the word would be speed. Everything is moving faster and faster. I mean, you, to take out a warranty, you'd have to be an idiot. <laughs> Everything gets outdated so quickly. So, in summation, there is God within you, there is God around you, there is God everywhere you look. If you keep your eyes closed, you won't see him. But if you open them, he becomes very clear and evident. And we'll continue with the thoughts about him in the next lecture. Thank you for coming.